in a small town south of Washington, D.C., lives a man who would be president of Iraq. He's waiting for two events, the fall of Saddam Hussein and a call from the Iraqi people. Across the Atlantic, waits the man who would be king. 44 years in exile, he waits with mounting anticipation for the moment of his return to Baghdad. It's something that one has been working towards all my life. Uh, and um, to actually finally have it in one's sights is, is an indescribable feeling. And the man who would be power broker. Power walking through life, racing to bring about the ultimate confrontation. Well, we make no bones about it. We want United States help to remove Saddam from power. Amongst Iraqi exiles, there's growing euphoria. They're counting down the days until America strikes and new leaders emerge to take Iraq into the future. But those who would lead are at loggerheads, consumed by infighting, divided by religion, tribe, ethnicity, politics, and by lust for power. Every single one of them believes that he alone you know, is, the, is the anointed next leader of Iraq. And that just doesn't work. Yet from this fractured leadership, America is trying to cobble together a coalition that will convince the world it has a plan, any plan at all, to stop Iraq falling into chaos if it succeeds in ousting Saddam Hussein. kilometers from Baghdad and hidden in the anonymity of a working-class town in middle America, an Iraqi general sits at a kitchen table and plots the fall of Saddam Hussein. Brigadier General Najib al Salahi, Chief of Staff, 1st Mechanized Division, 5th Corps of the Iraqi Army, until he defected seven years ago. He uses a borrowed map to explain how America can invade his own country. The details he saves for chats he says he has with the CIA and the Pentagon. The general believes Iraqis will need a man of sound military experience to hold the country together in the immediate aftermath of Saddam. الجو بالعراق دائما يعني العراق والمنطقة يشجع على بروز الدكتاتوريات. Al Salahi sees himself as a future contender as president of Iraq, but for now he does his own chores, prefers anonymity, chooses his meeting places carefully, and is fussy about who he talks to. Even in American suburbia, he knows his ambitions can be dangerous. He's already had a warning from Baghdad in the form of a videotape sent to him after his defection. Hi, how are you? It showed his sister being raped. Saddam Hussein sees any opponent he talks about as a threat and a threat. At 51, Al Salahi's days of riding tanks are over. But he thinks his military background would help him become a good president. 
He modestly states a recent opinion poll on an internet site for Iraqi exiles chose him as the preferred leader. But adds the poll was taken off the web by jealous rivals. Iraq is sad. لهذا كله يعني أعتقد أنه لو تتوفر شروط للديمقراطية الحقيقية في العراق ويكون العراقيين حرية كافية في انتخاب من يحملوا المسؤولية للعراق القادم أعتقد ستكون هناك لي فرصة مناسبة As plans for an American jihad against Saddam advance, some in the administration argue only a military strongman could hold Iraq together in the aftermath. Al Salehi's name is bandied about, if only because the most prominent exiled general is facing a war crimes investigation in Denmark over the use of chemical weapons in the Iran-Iraq war. He could go back and set up a military government to replace Saddam, which is the most logical thing to do if you're really interested in holding this country together. What you don't, can't introduce in, into Iraq today is democracy. It'd be total chaos. Any talk of an American-sponsored military strongman raises alarm bells amongst most opposition figures, particularly Shia Muslims like Hamid al-Bayati, who comprise 60% of the Iraqi population and who suffered at the hands of a Sunni-dominated army. Al-Bayati represents the Supreme Council of the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, a Shia opposition group with Iranian backing. So the idea that Iraq needs a strong man is complete anathema to you, is it? Exactly so. I think uh, um, this is a myth and a strong man will cause chaos as Saddam did and then we will see another war because there is tension between Iraq and neighboring countries. If we have a, a new weak regime then we might have more troubles. <laughs> Another city, another continent, another climate, and another plan for a brighter Iraqi future. This is uh, King Faisal II, the last king of Iraq. Um, he was assassinated when he was uh, 23 years old. I was uh, a young child at the time. I was. Uh, uh, just almost to two, in fact. Mm. Sharif Ali uh, bin al Hussein, spirited out of Baghdad in 1958 in the wake of his uncle's assassination, Iraq's he's never been history. back home. Well, it, was, it was the beginning uh, of, of the uh, bloody history because it uh, undermined the legitimacy of um, go the government and it enabled anybody who had the opportunity to get on a tank to assume government. And the problem then became that that was the only way to stay in power and has been a direct line to Saddam Hussein. The gentleman in the center is my grandfather. He was... Uh, Sharif uh, Ali is a 42nd generation descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Like General al Salehi in America, he sees himself as someone around whom a shattered nation can coalesce. Some form of uh, figurehead, some form of uniting influence is needed in a country that has been divided by Saddam Hussein. And for, for you, an obvious possibility, at least, then, must be the monarchy. Well, uh, I'm from the feedback that we get from inside Iraq. It gives us a great deal of uh, confidence that that is what is required by the Iraqi people. That is what they want. Do you think that's a likely outcome or not? I don't see it uh, a likely outcome. Um, as we know, the monarchy was demolished in 1958. It's difficult to restore monarchy in 2002. In the eyes of America's European allies, the inability of opposition leaders to agree on a shape for a future Iraqi government is a critical flaw. And it's a failure acknowledged by one of Washington's most influential proponents of ousting Saddam. Isn't it an almost fatal situation to be possibly so close to the toppling of Saddam and for no one to have emerged like that? Well, I think we should have started on this a long time ago. 
uh, and the political strategy has lagged behind uh, our thinking about how to deal with Saddam in a, in a physical sense. But I think now we will begin to see the pace quicken and there will be more political activity rather than less. In London, a rare and extraordinary gathering of men who prefer to live in the shadows. Under American pressure to put on a public exhibition of unity, opposition leaders are meeting to announce the formation of a new military council intended to take control of the Iraqi army when Saddam falls. So how do you feel about talk of having a, a military man in the interim for some period until elections are organized? Would that worry you? Well, uh, if this military man is uh, working for uh, political uh, role, well, uh, he is uh, most welcome. One of the leaders of this new council is General Al Salihi, visiting from America to make his pitch. But for all the show of unity, there are boycotts. One general accuses the new military council of simply grabbing power from a well-established outfit that he leads. I was, you know, decided not to go because we already established that two years ago. So if there was already a military council established, why did they decide to try and set up another one? I think right now some politicians uh, playing a role in and using some factions here. And I think that's not a healthy condition for us. We have to be united. Back at the conference, there's more confusion for observers trying to read the winds of the exile movement. Jordan's influential Prince Hassan turns up unexpectedly and causes a stir that will ripple around the Arab world. And with a kiss, he seems to bestow his blessing and support on his cousin, Sharif Ali, the man who would be king of Iraq. With this one appearance, the prince has broken Arab unity opposing America's plans for Iraq, to the embarrassment of his own government and to the delight of the exiled opposition. <laughs> Prince Hassan is a man of enormous influence and standing in the Arab world and internationally, and we welcome his presence. Well, John Wayne's house is over here. When John Wayne was here, we used to see his bald head like mine over at White's almost every weekend. Nowadays, Bob Bayer watches with a degree of cynical detachment as Iraqi opposition leaders ride the wave of American threats to dispose of Saddam. It really turned into a beautiful day, didn't it? Yeah, it really did. How much farther could it be from the Middle East sitting right here? It's nice weather. We're not getting shot at. There's no coups going on. A 20-year veteran of the CIA's Israel. Middle East operations, Bayer reflects yeah. the views so of the many pragmatists the of the CIA and the State Department. They're mounting a rearguard action against the influence of what they see as the unrealistic ideologues urging the Bush administration to act without any clear idea of the consequences. What everybody knows in Washington is that there's no end game plan. Who's going to replace Saddam? They don't have the slightest idea. Um, what's going to happen to the minority Sunni community? Nobody knows. Uh, do you have to go in and destroy the military? which would create a vacuum in Iraq. No one's dealing with that. But you have a, a, a almost a segregated class in Washington, which they call the neoconservatives, who've made up their mind without any facts or any intellectual backing what they want to do. It's impossible to put democracy in Iraq. The country's never had a democracy. It's going to take years. Bob Baer, with his experience on the ground, and until you said that, I had a lot of respect for him. Um, <laughs> should know that the Iraqi people can do better than that. Danielle Pletka, Vice President, Foreign and Defense Policy, American Enterprise Institute. 
a neoconservative think tank that is helping drive the US agenda on Iraq. These neocons have a direct line into the White House through Vice President Dick Cheney. And powerful backers like Donald Rumsfeld and Paul Wolfowitz in defense, who see Iraq as the next step in the war on terror and an opportunity to establish a democratic, pro-Western beachhead in the Middle East. You either stand up for what is right and you work for it and you try and attain it, with the understanding all the while that you may not get there and that it takes a lot of political capital and that it takes a lot of serious commitment and that you may not be 100% up to the job in the end. But I mean, to, to fight for nothing? Why? If you may not be up to it to, in the end, that means... No, you may you not get a live, perfect result. You have to live with the prospect of failure. You have to live the with the prospect The prospect of failure will be a very expensive one, won't it? I don't think, I think getting rid of Saddam is a success in and of itself. When Saddam falls, if he ever does, if he doesn't die in his bed, widespread violence is going to occur. Chances of civil war are very high. And whoever is spewed up from this chaos, we don't know who it is. Well, I, I don't know quite how you respond to that. Uh, maybe Mr. Bear knows something that, uh, that I don't know. Richard Pearl one of Washington's principal neocons, chairman of the influential U.S. Defense Policy Board. I, I simply think he's wrong about that. Why? Well, he's, he's guessing that, uh, that removing Saddam will be difficult. I think it will turn out to be uh, much easier than many people think. But you're I, guessing also, aren't you? Yes, of course, we're both yeah. guessing. I so, just think he's made the wrong guess. <laughs> one may be right, one may be wrong. It's a... well, one of us is going to be right. In such an overheated climate, it's hardly surprising that the Americans are confused and frustrated by the babble of conflicting Iraqi opposition leaders, each struggling to make their voices heard. By some counts, there are now more than 50 opposition groups, each claiming support from within Iraq, but none able to prove it. Everybody wants to get the access. Everybody wants to get the pat on the head from the vice president or the president or the secretary of state. And so they're all fighting about that. And they'll continue to fight about that until the United States puts its foot down. Uh, wait, I have another cliche coming. Knocks a few heads together and, uh, and says, you know, either get along or get out. To bang heads together to produce one single leader, I doubt it if it, if it work in the Iraqi context. It would be a failure. Uh, it would be um, it would be a failure, and uh, it has to be done through other means than banging heads. Sometimes it takes banging heads together. We should be looking for someone who can bring the Iraqi people together, who can be a moral force as well as a political figure. Richard Pearl reckons he's found just such a man in his friend and political ally, Ahmed Chalabi. <laughs> the most controversial figure in the Iraqi opposition movement. <laughs> Leader of the Iraqi National <laughs> Congress, or INC, an opposition umbrella group formed 10 years ago, Chalabi struggles daily to stop the group fragmenting and to hose down constant personality clashes. <laughs> Today in London, he's dealing with another general, threatening to form yet another breakaway military council. This one reportedly designed to preserve Sunni influence in a post-Saddam army. It's a closed-door meeting that ends with a display of unity that is only skin deep. كما أنت قلت أنها مشتتة متفرقة لها أهداف مختلفة لها نوايا مختلفة لا يمكن أن تلتقي على قاعدة حقيقية واحدة فلذلك أنها لا تنقل إلا المرض والشقاق إلى داخل العراق إذا لم تكن هناك سيطرة قوية أربين فرنتيك ومدى الترمينيشن أو الزلط شالبي is by turns loved and loathed by US power brokers we are difficult allies we have an agenda for the liberation of our country. And we have a relationship with the United States government in all its aspects. We have different views sometimes on how to proceed with uh, the liberation of our country. 
they have uh, some t uh, traditionally held views which we believe are erroneous and no longer valid. But amongst the neocons and Republican right in Congress, Chalabi's found a natural constituency of power brokers who believe the U.S. should have destroyed Saddam after the Gulf War. He spent 10 years drip-feeding them with reports from defectors about Saddam's plans to develop weapons of mass destruction. And more recently, with alleged links between Saddam and the Al-Qaeda network. And he's won the powerful American Jewish lobby by holding out the prospect of a democratic Iraq signing a peace deal with Israel. Ahmed Chalabi has certainly led the opposition for many years, uh, has led it in a very positive direction, that is with a, um, a policy that calls for uh, the establishment of democratic institutions and the renunciation of weapons of mass destruction and a positive approach to the peace process in the region. Now, you can't get a better platform than that from the point of view of any Western liberal uh, democracy. So he is the West's man in that sense? I think he very much reflects uh, Western values, which is not surprising. He's a PhD in mathematics, uh, trained in the West. And at the same time, he uh, comes from an, a distinguished uh, Iraqi family and has devoted his, uh, his life to uh, uh, trying to uh, produce a unified opposition to Saddam Hussein. The INC still likes to remain discreet about its location. But unlike the backroom operations of other opposition groups, Chalabi's built a formidable base in London, largely funded by the US government. There's a smooth public relations department and lobbyists who know how to sell the cause. In Finland, every development concerning the Iraqi situation is keenly followed and Keski Suomi Leinen would be eager to hear the authentic voices of the Iraqi opposition in its pages. Okay, we accept. And if uh, the president justified the link between Al-Qaeda and Iraq, the United States could go permission, blanket permission by the Senate to go to war, which is great news. The UN it was from the Washington office with endless meetings in the boardroom that Chalabi the neoconservatives and their friends in Congress parlayed the opposition's greatest coup in 1998. An act to establish a program to support a transition to democracy in Iraq. I ask unanimous consent. They the forced a reluctant right Clinton administration to accept the Iraq Liberation Act, a law that made support for Saddam's opposition official U.S. policy. In the record. Without objection, so ordered. He's a pest. He gets in because he fights to get in, because he makes the connections he needs to make to get the access he needs to get to get the profile for the cause. And he's really serious about that, and you have to admire it. Such success is all the more remarkable because Chalabi is deeply distrusted in a deeply divided administration. Detractors in the State Department and the CIA accuse him of overselling the INC's capacity to provide leadership, to gather useful intelligence, and to command an insurrection from within Iraq with American military assistance. The support from the professionals is, is, is very, I mean, is, there is none. I mean, the CIA, as I understand, has cut off contact with Chalabi, Ahmed Chalabi, the leader of the INC. Uh, they have infrequent contact with the opposition. It's just to figure out if anything new ap appears. But the CIA has stated, and on good grounds, that the opposition alone cannot get rid of Saddam Hussein. It's impossible. And to say today it's all changed and that suddenly the opposition has sterling intelligence and a capability of leading an insurrection is, is a fantasy. Why then the disapproval of the State Department and the CIA of uh, Dr. Chalabi? I think he's too independent for their tastes. The CIA likes people that it can put on the payroll and simply instruct. And the State Department uh, has similar tendencies, and uh, uh, Ahmed Chalabi speaks his mind. It's one of the reasons why he's a leader.
we make no bones about it. We want United States help to remove Saddam from power. We are not acting in any irresponsible way. We want to remove Saddam. Now, Congress has said, help those people inside Iraq. There is the Iraq Liberation Act, which says the United States policy is to help those Iraqis remove Saddam from uh, power and establish democracy in Iraq. That's the intent and the language of the Iraq Liberation Act. Compounding distrust in Washington is distrust of Chalabi amongst Iraqis themselves, who are uneasy about his deep ties with the Americans. The INC undermined the reputation of the opposition when they received public American money and when they um, received uh, American training. We are independent. We want to be independent. So you see, you see the INC and Mr. Chalabi as, to some extent, a puppet of the State Department, of the CIA, of the, of the Pentagon? Not necessarily so, but if an organization receives American money, then they have to comply with their conditions. And right now, the only organization we left in the INC are the Kurdish movements. The nationalists is outside, like the INA, the Islamists are outside, the leftists are outside. Everyone wants to uh, have their point of view, but my own way, uh, the, my, uh, the paramount uh, aim for me is to build a consensus of the Iraqi opposition forces and uh, to build this consensus for the benefit of the Iraqi people towards democracy. More divisive still, there's serious opposition to Chalabi's gung-ho attitude towards U.S. military intervention to topple Saddam. We believe that America shouldn't invade Iraq. We have an alternative strategy. We told the American that. We believe that the Americans should work through the international legitimacy, which is the UN resolutions, to protect Iraqi people, and then Iraqi people will be able to overthrow the regime, as they did in 1991. They were nearly overthrowing the regime, but the American decided to stand with Saddam against the uprising of 1991. Unlike many exiled groups or leaders uh, who have no responsibilities, we have a responsibility toward three and a half million people. And uh, the Kurdish leadership cannot afford to make any more mistakes. Can you assess for me the problem of disunity amongst the Iraqi opposition? Most of the opposition groups are not based inside the country like the Kurds, for instance. Uh, therefore, they lack credibility in the eyes of the Iraqi people. And uh, the other reason is really there are too many chiefs and very few Indians, as they say. From Europe to the Middle East, the disunity within the Iraqi opposition and America's failure to articulate a cohesive strategy to stop Iraq fracturing in civil war if Saddam falls is causing deep unease. In Jordan, a longtime friend of the US, there is despair at the consequences of the superpower trying to impose its will on the region. What would happen to Iraq? Would it integrate to three states? You worry it would disintegrate? Well, very disintegrate Iraq into three states. And is that a serious concern? And that's a very serious concern, naturally. Well, what will happen? It's a, some, a country which is an po important country, which has, we hope that it will play a moderate, stabilizing factor in the region. It will become sort of a factor of destabilizing the area, all of the region. Well, some would say that it's already a destabilizing factor in the region. Well, it's a and political it argument which you can put it the way you want. The question is, is the, th the bad thing you know is better than the things which you don't know. What's known as the Arab Street, public opinion, is already deeply suspicious of U.S. intentions because of America's unswerving support for Israel in the conflict with the Palestinians. And beyond that, 
Arab economies and confidence are still reeling from a decade of events that include the Gulf War and the aftershocks of September 11. Arab traders, as good a litmus test as any, despair at the trend to more conflict. Our uh, economy will be bad if there is a war. There is a relation between Iraq and Jordan and Jordan by uh, trading. Mm. And if there is a war, they will stop our trading. This military action could have very serious negative consequences on the state of Iraq, on the Iraqi people themselves, and on the neighboring countries. As for the Iraqi opposition in exile, Arab opinion is at best cynical, at worst derisive, particularly for Ahmed Chalabi, who's best remembered in Jordan as the man whose bank collapsed in a major financial scandal 13 years ago. The Americans have been trying to pump life into this opposition for two years now, and they have failed. This is a mockery. It's not opposition. It's a bunch of thugs. Some of them are convicted even in Jordan. The head of the uh, opposition assembly, uh, Mr. Chalabi, is sentenced in Jordan for siphoning maybe more than $200 million uh, uh, out of the bank that he was managing. So you're talking about people who lack credibility, who have no base in their ho own homeland. What do you know Ahmed Chalabi is wanted here? So we don't trust him. Wanted back in Jordan, that is, to serve a 20-year jail sentence imposed by a military court over the 1989 collapse of the bank he owned. Jordan's central bank says he left debts amounting to the equivalent of 10% of Jordan's economy at the time. It was a notorious case that still evokes controversy in financial circles at all levels. The criminal proceedings that established the criminal acts of, uh, of Petra and Chalabi uh, were also translated through uh, civil proceedings which condemned Chalabi and his uh, family and uh, others uh, to, to an amount of almost half a billion dollars. No, that is a, that's a false claim. The military court made the judgment. We were not permitted to defend ourselves. We were tried in absentia. And every co-defendant uh, with me of any, of any charge was exonerated. In fact, the governor of the central bank made it his own mission to try to engineer a collapse of the bank. We withstood this. This is Mr. Nablusi. Yes. He, he uh, thought that I was responsible for his dismissal as governor of the central bank in 1985. So this is a personal vendetta, you say? And he continued to bear this garage. I have no vendetta with him. This is the total sum of the committee, investigation committee's reports. Which the governor six, rejects uh, claims of vendetta. And he has tomes, not just from the court proceedings, but of in independent of and government investigations, as testament to the draining of the bank's accounts. Equity. There is no question whatever in my mind because most of the uh, embezzlement and the fraud actions that were, were made directly by him and in the interest of his, himself, his family, and other institutions outside the country that he established in Lebanon and Switzerland. If my aim was enrichment, if my aim was to um, acquire wealth in this ill um, used way, then why would I go and risk my, my life and put my family and myself in this extreme danger and withstand all these public attacks and, and rather than go and enjoy the ill-gotten gains that I was supposed to have made? In the Arab world, the stain of a very public financial scandal is permanent but it doesn't matter a damn to his American boosters. But it, it is absolutely immaterial. I mean, well, it, it's it has to be material if you see him as a leader and a spokesman of the Iraqi cause. No, it doesn't matter. You pick a person for a cause, and you go forward for their ability to keep the group together and for their commitment to that cause, and you view them all the while as a transitional figure that either will or will not be able to prove themselves to the Iraqi people. 
No one knows just how Chalabi or the rest of the opposition forces are viewed from Baghdad. But American neocons whip up the image of benign ripples from a Western-style democracy flowing from Iraq into neighboring dictatorships, like another one of George W. Bush's axis of evil nations, Iran. It will give tremendous hope to uh, those who are in similar situations, who are ruled by people they never chose in a manner that they despise. These, of course, would be dictators who are as much America's friends in the Middle East as they are enemies. Well, they, uh, this, the this, will, this will include a number of, uh, of regimes. Certainly the Iranian regime, the, the mullahs, uh, uh, would be removed tomorrow if you had a free vote in, uh, in Iran. But the Saudis also? Well, I don't know about the Saudis. Possibly the Kuwaitis? I don't know about the Saudis or the, or the Kuwaitis. <laughs> U.S. strategists may not wish to face the prospect that a free vote for Iraqis on the morning after Saddam could even present an opportunity to the mullahs of Iran. Iraq's 60% Shia community, with its religious and political ties with Tehran, could easily swamp the Sunni Arab vote. While the Kurds in the north also have political ties with the Iranians. And could the United States stomach a leader that came from a possibly Tehran leading Shia? It's a very interesting question. I mean, I guess if you're in for a dime and you're in for a dollar, and you should probably stand up for the things you believe in. Other, in other words, you should stand up for democracy. I think we have to recognize that, that if the Shia are going to have a role in this, which they are and they must, that the Iranians are going to have an interest in this. Do we want the Iranians to have a controlling interest? No, no question. We don't want the Iranians to have a controlling interest. To the contrary, we want Iraq to be the exemplar for Iran and then get rid of those guys. Amidst such uncertainty grows a conviction on all sides that George W. Bush can hardly afford to back down now on his threats to get rid of the man who less than 20 years ago was lauded and supported by America as a bulwark of the region. Saddam's people are certainly taking the threat seriously. Is it your belief that no matter what Iraq says or does now, that George Bush is determined to move against the president of Iraq. نعم لدينا قناعة أنه مهما قدم العراق من تعاون إيجابي مع الأمم المتحدة ومع مجلس الأمن هذه يعني حالة جديدة في العلاقات الدولية أن يذهب رئيس لإعلان نفسه وصيا أو أو مخولا بتغيير الأنظمة في العالم. The combination of Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destruction is a threat that is too serious to go un, uh, unanswered. And the only plausible answer is to remove him from office. So I believe that the decision has been made by uh, the American president that that will be the policy of the United States. So it's no longer a question of if, but when. It's a question of when. is a question that preoccupies hundreds of thousands of Iraqi exiles across the globe as they await with a mixture of anticipation and apprehension America's decision to launch its assault on Saddam. Most Iraqis do not believe Saddam's had his last bark or last bite. They know him well. They know his wily resistance and his ability to split his enemies in the West and the Iraqi opposition itself. Somewhere in America, far from the front line, 
Opposition figures remain so wary that it's taken several weeks to arrange this meeting through an intermediary with another former general. general. Hello, I'm Peter George, ABC Australian. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Do you feel insecure here? Do you think that really is a threat? No, I'm secure, but uh, we have to be cautious because Saddam Hussein following everybody. This is a critical, dangerous, but inspiring time, says General Al-Shamiri. So it's high time the opposition puts aside its differences and starts to work with unity for the common cause. They are very sincere to overthrow the regime, but the only thing we need just to defeat the selfishness within ourselves and build a bridge of trust among us. They will do the job. When you talk about selfishness amongst yourselves, what do you mean? Some people still have an attitude to work individually. And Is that because each one wants to be the next right, leader of their nation? Right. Is it a bit of a danger, though, that the factional nature of Iraqis in exile, the politicians and the military people, means that it will undermine efforts to both get rid of Saddam and also to rebuild the country afterwards? Right. I agree with that. Many believe America's already set off on its crusade against Saddam and that getting rid of him may even prove the easy part of the job. Coupling together a new leadership, strong enough to hold this fractious, oil-rich and strategically important nation together, is a more difficult proposition. And it's hardly begun. The evidence is that military plans for a march on Baghdad are detailed and well advanced. But the planning for what happens next seems no more substantial than a desert breeze.